Over the past couple of months, I've been receiving a lot of questions regarding how I went about setting up the color point system in one of my previous uploads. This went as far as people offering money, but I don't think that this information should be gatekept, so I'll walk you through my approach the best I can. I've also included a few links in the description to resources where you can learn more about Soundscape, but as far as I know, I'm one of the few who doesn't gloss over the color point system. There are also likely better ways to do what I'm going to show you, but this is what I found works for me. I'll start off by showing you an example of this in practice. As we walk towards the trees, we can begin to hear some birds. Go into an area of flowers, we can hear bees. If we go into an area of tall grass, we can hear crickets. And if you have a good ear, you might have noticed some wind coming from above which I've set up to happen in areas with trees, and I feel like it adds some extra depth and immersion to the environment. To begin our setup, we'll first enable the plugin. You can go to Edit, Plugins, and search Soundscape for this. And after enabling, you might need to restart your project. I only have two here because I've been messing it out with some project files for a later video, so you'll only see one. Next, we'll set up our gameplay tags. I already have a data table set up where I've named my rows, area, and content. To create a data table, you just have to right click, go to miscellaneous, select data table, and select the gameplay tag table row structure, or click add to begin creating your entries. In this example, I went with an area of the swamp and selected the content row of frog. In the project settings, you will then need to add your table to the gameplay tag table list. And you'll see that our swamp and our frog become visible in the gameplay tag list alongside our other data table contents. In the level blueprint, I've set the state to the testing grounds for my original data table. This is fine for this demonstration, however you might want to change states when colliding with trigger boxes for more complex levels. After that, we'll then set up a soundscape color. This will contain information about our sound and how it will behave. I've called this color frog, but I'll use an existing meta sound of a random bee for now. As for the options we have, we can set the base volume and pitch. We can randomize the volume and pitch, which I would suggest doing in most cases. We can fade the sound in and out, but I won't use it for this sound. We have a few playback options that I haven't gone into just yet. We can delay the first spawn, which is useful when you don't want the player to be bombarded with sounds. We can continuously respawn the sound. You'll likely be adjusting these values a lot until you feel what you have created is natural enough. We can change the maximum number of spawned elements, which you can kind of think of like concurrency. We can set how far we want the sound to spawn from the listener. We can change the sound angle and clamp the height, which I also won't be using for this example. We can also position the sound by an asynchronous trace. This is useful when you want sounds to spawn on the floor, walls, or a ceiling. And most importantly, we can set a color point to one of our tags. After that, we'll specify how many color points we want the sound to spawn around. In the case of a frog and a swamp, you might only want to specify one swamp, However, you might want frogs to spawn around 5 or more lily pads, in which case you will set the number to 5. I'll go over how we'll be handling this data a bit later. It's also worth noting that you can use clamp height alongside position by trace and colour points. My birds, parrots and rustling tree sounds all spawn at clamp heights around the trees. My bees also spawn using position by trace, with a clamp height of about 100 to 200 so they're a bit off the floor. I like to use relative altitude in the clamp height mode, however you might want to use a world height in instances where colours only spawn at certain heights in your world, like an eagle that was only spawned really high up in the sky. After that we'll create a palette to contain our colours. As you can see I have one already created with my existing colours, and you can do this by right clicking, going to sounds, soundscape, and clicking soundscape palette. I'm going to call this a swamp, and select any tags that match. Here, I would then specify the swamp area tag, but I'll use our existing testing ground area tag for now. We can then save and close, and click the plus button to add our colours. We also need to add this palette to our project settings collections. In the player blueprint, I've set up a looping event. This event will first remove my current collection from the subsystem, clear out the collection variable, perform a trace function to gather the data around the player, add this to my collection variable, and then add this back to the subsystem. While this is running every 3 seconds, you could definitely trace your level once on begin play. I've only chosen this approach as I wanted to support larger levels where the environment might change, 
so feel free to experiment with your implementation. I have two variables on the player, one being a Soundscape color point collection structure, and one map of gameplay tags and trace channels. As you can see, the gameplay tags are set to be the keys, and the trace channels are the associated variables. For example, my tree, grass, and flower gameplay tags are mapped to the trace channels of trees, tall grass, and flowers respectively. To set up a trace channel, go to your project settings, type in trace, and click new trace channel. I would also suggest setting the default response to ignore. For example, I might want the swamp trace channel to check for any blocking foliage associated with the swamps. I can then go into foliage mode, select the instances I want to block the channel, and check the blocking response. You can see that these flowers are already blocking the flower channel that our bee wants to spawn around. In the function itself, I've looped through each key, that is our trees, grass, and flower gameplay tags, and for each key, I've retrieved the associated trace channel. From here, I can check if there are any hits, and if so, we can continue. As commented, this section is just for debugging. If we find any hits, then we first clear out the foliage locations, which is a local vector array variable. While this variable will be cleared each time we run the function, as it's a local variable, we are looping through our keys, so there are going to be several sets of vectors to consider. From there, we do one more loop through the hit results, casting to foliage instance static mesh component using the hit component as the object reference, and the hit item as the instance index when getting the instance transform. Remember to tick world space and then add the foliage instance to our vector array. Once we have looped through all foliage blocking the channel, we then need to add this data to a temporary collection. This collection is a color point collection vector array structure and contains two members, a color point and an array of vectors. The color will simply be the gameplay tag array element from our previous loop, and as you may have guessed, we can pass in the vector array as the last pin. Lastly, we'll return the temporary collection. This temporary collection will then be set into our current collection variable and then added back into the subsystem. I'll turn on debugging so you can see more clearly what this approach is doing. When we play the game, the trace is now visible around the player, as well as the amount of each blocking hit in the top left. I find this useful when tuning the colour point number from earlier. If you're having any problems getting colour points working, I'd first suggest playing around with your hash sizes in the project settings. Additionally, I noticed there's an issue where clamped height will struggle to work when the player is in a negative Z world height. I understand this might have been a lot of information to process due to the relatively long setup, but I hope this video gave you some insight into how you might set up colour points regardless.